Greetings to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I bring you greetings here from Friendship Baptist Church. On behalf of our pastor, Dr. Reginald E. Backus, our Sunday School Superintendent, Sister Frederick Williams, all of the officers and members of this church, we're just so blessed that you are joining us for our general Sunday School overview. If you've been following us for these last four years, we praise God, as always, for your presence, for your support and especially for your prayers. But if you stumbled upon us for the first time, we don't believe it's an accident. We believe that the Holy Spirit has led you to us, and we're just so thankful for your presence. Uh, we have so much wonderful work going on here at Friendship, and so we encourage you to not only subscribe to our channel, but to turn on notifications, like our videos. Not only will it help you uh, know what's happening here at Friendship, but it will also help us share our content with a wider audience. It's our prayer that all of our work be, uh, for the glory of God, to strengthen the believer's relationship with him and to draw non-believers out of darkness and into the marvelous light. We have a wonderful lesson today. It's entitled Growing Strong, taken from the 13th chapter of Matthew, Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 9 and verses 18 through 23. Our key verse uh, is Matthew chapter 13, verse 23. But he who receives seed on good ground is he who hears the word and understands it who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. And so it's our prayer that in today's lesson we will examine the parable from the perspective of one who sows, that secondly we will celebrate God overseeing the success of our efforts in his kingdom, and third and finally we will accept the success from God that comes in various forms. And so we will begin with prayer and jump right into our lesson. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for another opportunity to study your word. We thank you for all that you continue to do in our lives. Father, we confess that we have stumbled and fallen short, but we thank you for brand new mercies, brand new graces each and every day. We thank you for our church, for our pastor, Dr. Backus, our Sunday school superintendent, Sister Frederick Williams. We thank you for each and every Sunday school instructor and student throughout all of Christianity. Now bless us as we attempt to study your word, to learn more about you, to be more like you, to be better equipped to face the challenges of this world. Lift us up higher that we might see you clearer and better understand your will for our lives. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. It is in your darling and precious son, Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So we know about the book of Matthew. We were in this book uh, last week as well. As we continue to look at Jesus explaining to the people that follow him, the people that question him, uh, what the kingdom of heaven should look like and what our responsibility is as believers within God's kingdom. And so I won't do a lot of background on Matthew. We'll just jump right into our lesson. It's a little bit longer. I'm not sure how long it's going to take, and so I want to just jump right in. The first, our lesson is broken down into two parts. The first part is the parable, the sower, the seed, and the soil. And the second part is the parable's meaning. And so the first part is the first nine verses, verses 1 through 9. The second part is verses 18 through 23. So I'll be reading from the New King James Version Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. It says, On the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea, and great multitudes were gathered together to him. He got into a boat and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up and they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Amen, amen. And so the first part of our lesson again is entitled the parable, the sower, the seed, and the soil. And before we even get into the parable, let's first look at the two verses, the first two verses, and acknowledge how Jesus was able to take advantage of this teachable moment to both evangelize and disciple the crowds that followed him. So as news of Jesus' work continued to spread uh, in, the, in the New Testament, the crowds that followed him continued to grow. There were people that heard about the miracles of Christ that he performed, and they hoped that they could receive the same miracle in their own life. In the previous chapter, Matthew chapter 12, last week we covered how Jesus healed a demonic, possessed man who was also mute and deaf. 
And this man was healed, and word continued to spread about Jesus' power. Then there were crowds that followed Jesus out of faith in hopes that Jesus was indeed the promised Messiah, the, uh, the, the Son of God who had come to save Israel. And then there were crowds that simply were captivated by the excitement of the moment. In the midst of a society with very few options for entertainment, some people would just follow Jesus just to see what all the fuss was about. Now, regardless of the individual reasons for each person in the crowd, Jesus maintained his righteous and obedient presence and took advantage of the moment by teaching the crowd a lesson that would change their lives. So Jesus, he gets away from the crowd, and he sits in a boat, cast off a little bit outshore, and he created a pulpit out of a ship and began to teach to this massive crowd. Now, perhaps the biggest hindrance to modern-day evangelism is the mindset that we need to get unbelievers into the church house so that they can hear and receive the gospel message. Jesus sets an example that the word of God should not be reserved to the house of worship, but rather we should go out and spread the gospel during our everyday lives. Uh, uh, there's a phrase that we used to teach the young people, you sow as you go. Now, we don't know why Jesus decided at this moment to stop and begin teaching, and we don't know why he chose this exact moment as the time to share with this crowd, but we can celebrate that God opens doors and gives us opportunities to share his gospel message. I can't tell you how many times where I was looking for a way to kind of work in the word of God or to kind of introduce my relationship with God and see how I could kind of get that into a conversation or a relationship. And God just gives us opportunities that we never see, uh, never saw coming. And we should be not only able and excited to take advantage of those opportunities, but equipped, meaning we have something to share. Now, my mom used to work at the Daily Center when I was young. It's uh, downtown in Chicago. That's where her job was. And on half a day sometimes, and uh, I would take the train down. And I would go sit in her office, and we would go out to eat at lunch. And right across the street at the Marshall Fields, which is now a Macy's on State Street, there would be a man standing there in a suit with a bullhorn. And he had like this little makeshift radio with a bullhorn, and he would just be preaching all day, all day. And I used to think like, man, there are some crazy folks downtown. As I got older and better understood the word of God for myself, and I was able to mature in my faith, I started to realize that he wasn't crazy. He was just on fire for God and taking advantage of this opportunity, one of the most crowded streets in the South Loop, to proclaim the good news of the gospel truth. Now, I can confess, I have never seen anyone stop and profess a faith in Christ. I never see, saw, saw anyone stop and respond to him by giving him, them, him their hand and turning from being a lost person in darkness to being a believer and found in Christ. But I do know that I trust God's word, that some of us are called to plant, that some of us are called to water, and that God will give the increase. And even though I never saw it with my own eyes, I just know in my heart that there were some people that walked past that man and were encouraged. There were some people that were strengthened in their faith. There were some people that continue to hear his proclamations of truth and the gospel of Jesus Christ, and eventually that in tandem with other works of God by other believers possibly move them from non-belief to belief. And so even though as a young kid I thought this crazy man with a bullhorn was taking up too much space and just yelling at folks, I can now better appreciate how he just, I don't care what people think of me, I don't care what it looks like, I'm so on fire for God that I'll stand up and begin to preach. Two more examples. Two of my favorite theologians, Charles and John Wesley. The reason why we have the term soapbox preachers is because the way that they preached was considered uh, too boisterous and exciting for the church in England. And so they were literally put out the church and not allowed to preach. Instead of saying, because I don't have a pulpit to preach in, they took soap boxes and turned them upside down and stood on corners and just preached the gospel in the middle of the street. The church went crazy, and they eventually got ran off to the new land, to America. But while they were there, they said, I don't care where you'll let me into or what access you'll give me. Because I'm so on fire for Christ, I'll take advantage of any moment that I have and just preach the gospel. And the last example is a member of our own church, uh, Reverend Reginald Elback is the pastor of Mount Ollie Baptist Church in Brooklyn, New York. When he first got to Chicago, uh, 
Right. Uh, me and him, he, he and I used to talk, and I would ask him what was he about to do. He said, I'm going to get on this train and just go preach. And I'd be like, what train are you talking about? And he would take, like, the train through the worst neighborhoods in Chicago, and he would just sit in the back of the train and rap gospel lyrics. And again, I, I don't remember him ever telling me about anyone that confessed the faith in Christ. But in my heart, I do believe that as we continue to sow seeds, as we continue to evangelize, as we continue to preach the gospel, that even when we don't see the tangible results of our work with our own eyes, that God will not only bless our work, but he will make it fruitful and multiply our work. And so I celebrate people like Charles and John Wesley. I celebrate people like Jesus and his example of taking advantage of these preaching and teaching moments of our young pastor, Reginald L. Backus, uh, in New York that just has a fire for God that can't be contained by a location or access or the platform in which we have to preach. So we take manner not only in the moment or that Jesus took advantage of, but also the manner in which the message was delivered. The Bible says that Jesus stood on, uh, sat in the boat and the multitude stood on the shore. Now in the society in which we live in today, we're inundated with distractions and it's encouraging to see that the multitude committed to focusing on the word of God by standing and attentively, attentively paying attention and listening to the, uh, Jesus preach. Just recently, Christy and I, we were on our way to dinner in an effort to better communicate with ourselves. We have these shared calendars uh, where we're able to map out our schedules and ensure we aren't making commitments that we can't keep. So the dinner that we were headed to was on a shared calendar, and when we arrived, my iPhone asked me if I would like to switch my phone to do not disturb so that I would not be distracted during the dinner. Now, I find it interesting that each and every Sunday for the last 20 years of my life, my phone has had multiple church services scheduled across different calendars. Not once has my phone ever suggested that I change to do not disturb to attend church. But the time that we went to dinner, that was the immediate suggestion my phone made. The world in which we live suggests that we pay attention to sports uh, games, to food and dinners, to entertainment. Yet when we go to the house of worship, our attention seems to wander. Uh, there's an illustration about a woman that went to a pastor and she said that she was, uh, needed to switch churches. She said she loves the way that the pastor preaches, she loves the worship service, but she just has to leave and find a new church. The pastor asked her what was wrong. She said, well, on my pew, if I looked at everybody to the left of me and everybody to the right of me, they're talking, they're on their phone, they're playing games, and they're not paying attention. I want to go to a place where everyone is focused on the word of God. The pastor said, well, I understand that, but just stay one more Sunday. He said, during this next Sunday worship service, I'm going to fill a cup of water to the very top where even if you tilt it a little bit, a drop will fall out. He said, I want you to walk around the sanctuary two times without dropping a, a drop of water. The woman didn't understand, but she said, all right. And after the service, she went to the pastor and she gave him the cup. He said, I did what you asked me, did not spill one drop. The pastor said, while you were walking, can you tell me how many people were on their phone, how many people were talking, how many people were distracted? She said, oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't able to focus on them because I was carrying a glass of water, but I didn't drop anything. And then he told the woman, if you're able to focus on God doing worship, the same way you were able to focus on this glass of water, perhaps you would not be so distracted by other people in worship. The main point of the illustration is to teach us that we're only distracted by what we allow to distract us. But if we're able to focus on God and tune out the distractions of the world, then we are able to receive the word of God in such a better format. And so when we look at these people that were listening to Jesus Christ preach while he was sitting in the boat and they were standing attentively, it's an example to us of how we should be in tuned and focus on the word of God. This wasn't an external problem, but rather it's an internal problem. And even in recognizing the issue that it's hard to focus, it's an admission that we either fall prey to this bad habit ourselves or we lose focus on the worship that we find ourselves in by observing and focusing on other people. As believers, our prayer should be that God allows us to put on spiritual blinders and set our hearts, minds, and, and souls on God alone and set an example that others can follow by submitting to God in worship and giving God our full attention. So with the order and the style of worship that we have been drastic, that has been drastically altered since the COVID pandemic, church no longer lasts all day or hours on end. 
Therefore, with shortened services, we should be even more focused on God's word and grow to a point where the distractions of life are so insignificant in comparison to our worship that we can focus without distraction. And so I hate that we spent so much time on that, but I definitely didn't want to uh, skip the first two verses of our lesson, and now we can get directly into the parable. It says that Jesus began to teach the crowd speaking in parables. Now, parables are widely accepted as earthly stories with heavenly meanings. They're meant to help us believe by speaking to us in ways that we can understand from both a cultural and a social context. The parable in our lesson speaks of a sower who sowed seeds, seeds as he went out and the different types of ground that the seeds fell on. Now, first we must look at the main character in this parable, the sower. The sower not only sowed as he went, but he had enough seed to drop as he continued along his path. Now, I'm currently having issues with my front lawn. I had a very bad weed problem at the, begin of spring, at the beginning of spring, so I purchased weed killer. Now, unfortunately, not paying attention, I got the wrong type of weed killer, and it killed the grass with the weeds. I figured the easiest way to fix my problem was by buying some grass seeds, but I was quickly warned by the uh, salesperson at Home Depot to be careful because not all grass grows well in Chicago. I, quick, I quickly realized that buying any seed wouldn't do, but I needed to get the right seed or I would be simply wasting my time and money and not fix my problem. In life, if we look at evangelism and discipleship from an agricultural perspective, we must accept that before we begin to share, we must first have the correct information to share. Assuming that all believers have indeed given their lives to God and accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we must use our faith and the guidance of the Holy Spirit to grow from relationship in God to responsibility in God. Our responsibility as believers, each and every one of us, is to share the gospel message, to tell the dying world about a living Savior who gave his life that we might be saved. It is our responsibility to grow in relationship with God and equip ourselves with the knowledge and understanding of God's word through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. In almost every area of my life, once I realized the value or the worth of something or someone, I began to not only appreciate it more, but to learn as much as I could about it in order to better care and love for it. When I realized the value of the hardwood floors in my 100 plus year old home, I began to study how to better care for and protect the floors. I bought the right cleaners and I, and I used them in order to maintain its quality. When I first got to Howard University, I was so excited about the school that I began to study about the history and the legacy of the school and the students that came before me. In both instances, I appreciated what I had and I made a commitment to become an expert in it in order to better care for and better represent what God had blessed me with. In the same manner as believers, once we truly understand the gift that God has given us through his son, Jesus Christ, we should yearn for and seek out God's word in order to better represent God's word and to better understand and be able to share the gospel message in our everyday lives. This doesn't mean wearing a church shirt or simply showing up so our name can be checked off on the attendance sheet, but this is seeking out and cherishing the word of God so that we can both share it and allow it to permeate our lives and bring about change. In Proverbs chapter 2, and I believe it's verse 4, it says to seek out the word of God as silver, search for it as hidden treasure, then we will understand the fear of the Lord and the knowledge of God. If we are to truly be effective as evangelists, and it's important that we focus on evangelism in this lesson, especially uh, the way the Holy Spirit presented this lesson, we're currently going through a book of evangelism in our 6 p.m. evening Bible classes with Dr. Backus. But if we are to be effective as, evangelist, as evangelists and be best effective as tools of evangelism for God, we must commit to seeking out, learning about, and sharing the word of God in our everyday lives. From a sheer practical perspective, this means attending Sunday school, Bible class, taking advantage of Christian education at all levels, committing to our personal time and resources, to understanding and learning, and to turn away from anything that is contrary to God's word in our lives. Uh, there was a preacher at the National Congress in, in Louisville, and he was in the pastor's conference, and he simply posed the question, 
He said, if you spend more money on your wardrobe as a preacher than your study materials, there's something wrong. And he said, you should never have more money invested in your suits than you do in your books. And he was just trying to give a real life example of how as believers, we sometimes focus on the wrong thing. And it's not just for preachers. If we put more emphasis on what we're going to wear to church on Sunday morning than we do in preparing for our Sunday school lesson on Sunday morning, then our mind is not properly aligned with what we're committed to uh, do based on our confession and our belief in Christ and our responsibility from that confession. And so we just need to make sure that we're not just simply showing up, that we're not just simply being a part of the church body, that we're active in our faith, that we're growing in our faith and our understanding. And that comes from professional training in Christian education. Uh, taking advantage of these classes. There was something called iTunes University. It's no longer available because of YouTube. But when iTunes University came out, you could literally take classes from some of the best uh, seminaries in the, in the world. Dallas Theological Seminary, Gordon-Conwell, Moody Bible Institute. And even now still, if you go on YouTube and you type in some of these seminaries, you can take, excuse me, you can take some of the best classes by some of the best theologians living today for free. Now, you may not get the degree, or you may not get the certificate, and you may not get the graduation robe, but we don't do these things for public recognition. We do these things so that we can better equip ourselves with the word and be of better use to God. And so regardless of what level we participate in Christian education, and I'm assuming that the majority of people that are watching are either diligently seeking out the word of God or instructors themselves, Regardless of what level we have committed to growing in God's word, I would challenge us to double our time this week. If you spend four times in school, spend eight this week. If you spend four times listening to a sermon, spend eight this week. If you spend two hours uh, studying God's word, spend four hours this week. If you spend three hours praying, spend six this week. Whatever it is that our commitment to God is from a Christian education perspective, I challenge you just this week, to double that time and watch how the word of God will take hold and shape your life in a way that you never thought before. In addition to that, even within our own Baptist General State Convention, this week our Salem District Association is having our annual session. The Greater New Era District Association is having their Congress of Christian Education. In two weeks, we'll be in East Peoria at the Embassy Suites, where our own pastor, Dr. Backus, serves as the Congress President for the Baptist General State Convention of Illinois. Christian education, you can come and take two classes here, lectures, discussions, and preaching on the theme of how to be better evangelists in the world. And so there's so many opportunities. Now, while those are all isolated places uh, that have registration costs, in addition to those, there are so, 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 so many free resources that we can find on the internet with simple Google searches or YouTube searches where we can find an unlimited number of Christian education classes that will help us grow in understanding God's word. So first we looked at, this, at the sower. Second, we must look at the seed. Now the seed is perhaps the easiest to explain in this text. The seed is the word of God. The old preacher used to say, be careful how you live because you might be the only Bible that someone ever gets to see. In a world where unbelief or disbelief in, the, in, the, in, in theology or in a higher power continues to grow and belief in God continues to diminish, we must be more diligent than ever to represent the word of God, not just through our words, but through our actions. So many institutions in our society are suffering from very small percentages or individuals bringing shame and distorting the worldview of that institution that it creates a sense of doubt that is often difficult to overcome. Whether it's an isolated police officer that abuses their powers or one Supreme Court justice that takes advantage of improper donations, we see examples of misconduct and then we apply the actions of one towards the entire institution. As believers, we must recognize that we are in the same boat and we have a responsibility to not bring shame on the word of God or the body of Christ. The reason why our churches are struggling is not because the word of God is ineffective, but because we have sowed too much of the wrong seed and the world no longer understands who we are or what we believe because our actions contradict our language. We have to ensure that we are not only uh, 
uh, recognize our calling as sowers, but we take our responsibility serious by turning away from things that aren't like God. If the people of God can turn away from the world, we will stop diminishing our influence and our witness, and then the seed of God will take hold in the lives of those around us. So we looked at the sower, we looked at the seed, and then third, we must look at the ground. So when we look at the ground on which uh, the sower dropped the seed, the Bible is four different ways. The first was the wayside. In the wayside, the seeds weren't able to grow because there was no soil for them to grow. The birds came and ate them up. Now, while we may assume that this was a waste of time to sow on the wayside, we must recognize that the seed sowing on the wayside, on the wayside both kept the sower in a consistent lifestyle, but it might have also encouraged others to increase their own sowing so that the body might be encouraged by our own efforts. Sometimes a salesman might look at a potential customer and assume that trying to make a sale may be a waste of time, but a good salesman knows that there's no such thing as a bad pitch and you never know where the, good, where the next sale may come from. As believers, when we go out to evangelize, when we share the word of God, we should never predetermine who will receive God's word or when we will be effective. As believers, we should never turn on and turn off our sharing of the gospel. God requires our entire being to represent him, not just when it's convenient or when it appears that we will find success, but at all times in our lives. And again, there's always someone watching. And if we continue to share, if we continue to sow, even when we don't think anyone's looking or no one's listening, we have no idea the impact that we'll make in other people's lives by the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Now, the irony of that man that will be out there preaching the gospel in front of Macy's is that sometimes when there was no one within hearing distance, he wouldn't put down the mic and stop. He just kept going. Because there might have been someone driving past. There might have been someone across the street watching. There might have been someone that opened up their window and can hear. We have no idea how the word of God will take hold in the lives of other people. And so we must never turn off our witness. So first was the west wayside. Second place was the stony places. Here the seeds weren't able to grow because there was no depth. And the roots were unable to take hold, causing the seeds to die from a lack of nutrition once the sun came out and burned out the top. Now, these are places where growth seems to take place, but only for a short while. Now, being a lifelong churchgoer, I can remember dozens, maybe hundreds of people that were moved by the worship experience and professed their faith for Christ. These people started off on fire for the Lord, but soon drifted away for some reason and returned to their lives before Christ, abandoning the commitment that they once professed. Again, as believers, it's not for us to determine the commitment or the seriousness of another person's faith. Our job is to share the gospel and to believe in the power of God and pray that nothing that we say or nothing that we do uh, it become a hindrance or a stumbling block in someone else's faith journey. So the first was the wayside, second was the stony places, the third place was the thorns. Here the seeds weren't able to grow because they were consumed or choked up by the circumstances of the environment. Now, I grew up on the south side of Chicago across the street from Finger High School. My neighborhood was constantly ranked as one of the worst neighborhoods or the worst communities in Chicago. There were many young people in my community that grew up in difficult homes, uh, circumstances, or victims of social problems. I can't count how many of these young people were victims of their circumstances. And because of that, they fell behind in school and life because of the zip code and their home situations. Now, I can list dozens of these young people that could have been CEOs, doctors, lawyers, had it not been for the schools they went to or the mistakes that they made as a direct result of their difficult upbringing. As believers, we must recognize that we are up against the enemy and the, and, and the world as they continue to pull people away from God and into darkness. When we share the gospel, we must recognize the challenges in the lives of the people that we encounter and look for ways to meet their social needs so that difficult living situations don't hinder or reverse the work of God in their lives. There's a phrase that we use in missionary work, a grumbling stomach can't hear the preached word. If we pull someone off the drug corner, expose them to the gospel and watch the word of God take hold, and then send them right back to the drug corner, we must realize that there is a chance that the work might be delayed or even derailed based on their environment. 
Now, with the limited resources that we have, there isn't a lot that we can do with our own capacities to alleviate the social issues that plagued our nation, but we can be aware of what is available and be able to point people in the right direction so that resources can be found that can help people overcome their social issues and the inequalities that plague our communities. In other words, we may not be able to pay to fit someone's situation, but we can definitely point them in the right direction. And as sowers, we must recognize through building of relationships that our job is not just to preach and bark the gospel at people, but to understand the needs of people and show love by helping them overcome the challenges of their life so that they can be better uh, receptive of the word of God. So we looked at the wayside, the stony ground, the thorny, thorny ground, and then finally the fourth and the final type is the good ground. Here the seeds grow well with growth that is 100-fold, 60-fold, and even 30-fold. In a perfect world where the soil is right, if we sow according to God's commandment, we will see increase beyond what we can imagine. Now, if we were a publicly traded company, our shareholders would encourage us to seek out good ground and avoid the other three because our chances of success are maximized with good ground. However, as believers, and I might be speaking for myself, but I'm sure I have one or two witnesses out there, we can testify that some of us were met on the wayside. Some of us were met on stony and thorny ground. And even though the odds were stacked against us, God worked a miracle in our lives and pulled us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So we can't decide, and we'll get into this in next week's lesson too. It's not for us to decide where growth takes place. It's not for us to decide who's willing and who's able to receive the word of God or who will turn away from it. Our job is to sow as we go, each and every day, all day of our lives. Regardless of what the ground might appear to be, regardless of what the person that we're reaching out to or pointing to, how the receptive might, they might appear to be, our job is to sow and trust, like I said before, that some plant, some water, but it is God that gives the increase. Jesus ends this parable by saying that he who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is not a referee blowing a whistle to stop play and get the attention of the crowd, but rather it is a call for those that believe to yield to the truth of God's message. Believers should never be presented with the truth of God without allowing it to take hold and change our lives. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. It is our job to trust in the power of God's word. And again, not do anything or pray to God that he grows us, that we not do anything to hinder or derail the growth in other people's lives. So first we looked at the parable, the sower, the seed, and the soil. But the second and the final part of our lesson is the parable's meaning. Matthew chapter 13, verses 18 through 23, again in the New King James Version reads, Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on the stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, and cares, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. So hearing is not enough. And again, he goes through these four words, and we just covered it in depth, so I won't spend a lot of time here, but I do want to just point out a few things. The four types of road. The first was the wayside. A lack of understanding will allow lies and deceit to turn us away from the truth. And the word will have no room in our lives. And so this is where false teachers, false understanding can sneak into our lives. I always tell the story of how two Muslim classmates of mine in elementary school showed me in the Bible where God said, don't eat pork. And I thought that being a good Christian meant that I no longer should eat pork. And I actually refused to eat pork for about a year or two in my life, uh, missing out on some of my mama's best meatloafs and pork chops. When we allow 
when we don't have a good foundation, a good understanding of God's word, we can allow false prophets and, and false teachers to lead us astray. Now, thankfully, all I did was miss out on a few meals, but I became almost pious and judgmental, looking at others that did eat pork as if they were doing something contrary to God's word. So it's not just that we introduce people to the gospel, but that we encourage people to grow in the God's word and grow in understanding. The second way is, again, the stony ground. These are people that receive the word of God with joy, yet have no foundation or no perseverance. They allow the circumstances of life to turn them away. And that's moments of fire that quickly go out. I can't tell you how many people I've seen get so excited about the word of God. And the first time trouble finds its way into their life, they just give up, turn away, and, and, and return to their old ways. If we truly receive the word of God, and if we truly accept Jesus Christ not only as our Lord but as our Savior, there's a fire that can never be extinguished. I've had some difficult times in my faith, sometimes where I questioned why God allowed things to happen, sometimes where I was disgusted with the choices and the decisions I made for myself. But even in those difficult and challenging moments, I praise God that there was still the smallest remnant of my faith that allowed me to stay focused on God's word and not allow the distractions and challenges of life to turn me away. And we must make sure that we cultivate a fire within ourselves so that when we experience difficult and hard times, people can see our example and our perseverance, our steadfastness, and be encouraged so that they, when they experience those things in their own life, they can look at our example and the examples of other biblical heroes of the faith of our parents, our grandparents, those church mothers, when we hear these testimonies, it encourages us to look past the challenges of life and stay focused on God. So we saw the wayside, the stony ground. We also see the thorny ground. These, this is where temporary growth happens, but ultimately it's unfulfilled because these people are choked out by unspiritual things. The ground is almost too fertile and allows other things to grow or overgrow the word of God. And these are people that just jump from one belief to the next belief. People that just like, I don't want to say church hop, but these are people that faith hop, that allow whatever is popular and common uh, to just take hold in their lives. And within the black community especially, we're up against so many challenges to our faith. Uh, we have the Moorish Americans. We have the Nation of Islam. Uh, we have uh, the, the Muslim faith, the Jehovah Witness faith, the Church of Latter-day Saints. Now, many of these groups are good people by the world standards. And to be honest, many of these people are much more successful in their organization and the social work that they do for their communities than the Christian church, especially the black Christian church. However, regardless of the good works that they do or the social commitments that they have, they're still preaching against the word of God. And it's a message that will lead people not to heaven, but to hell. And I definitely don't want to disparage anyone in their beliefs, but we have to be honest with ourselves. The only way to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ, a relationship with, the, with Jesus that gives us access to God. Jesus died for our sins and paid the penalty for our sins so that we can be found not guilty by God. Anything that's contrary to that a pathway to eternal life is wrong, and it leads to hell. And there are some people that are on thorny ground that have allowed false teachings, false religions, false prophets to infiltrate their lives and they're just being pulled to and fro. As believers, we must not only double down on our own commitment to God, but we must set an example for others to see so that when these false teachings, when these false religions, when they encounter these things, that they're able to stay focused and planted and rooted in the word of God. So we see the wayside, the stony ground, the thorny ground, but finally we see the good ground. And I don't have to spend much time on good ground. It's where the word bears fruit in our lives. Now again, I wish that every young person that I ever got to minister to was good fertile ground, that they just listened attentively and their life was changed right then and there in the moment they never bounced back. 
I wish that as we move throughout our daily living at the grocery stores, at the gas stations, wherever it is that God leads us, that we can just encounter a good fertile ground where our example, our smile, our hug, our embrace, our handshake, our words will encourage others and draw them out of darkness and into the marvelous light. We say it all the time. Even Jesus said it in the Sermon on the Mount. I wish that I could cut my grass and someone says, you cut grass like a Christian. Teach me about Jesus. I wish that I could drive and someone said, you made that right turn like a Christian. Tell me about Jesus. Not saying that it do, it's impossible, but it just simply doesn't happen or it isn't, uh, it's rare if it does happen. That being said, our job is to recognize that every unbeliever is not good ground. But that doesn't mean that we cast them out, that we turn our backs on them, that we give up hope. It means that we trust in the power of God's word, that we find ways to move these people from the wayside and the stony ground and the thorny grounds into good ground. That we find ways to encourage people to change their environments and change their communities and change their groups of friends so that they can be encouraged in their faith with Christ and not drawn back into darkness. We must accept that we're at war. We are soldiers on the battlefield. And in biblical times when war would happen, you would just push forward until you could get one step. And once you got that step, you never retreated. You kept going forward. As believers, God has given us the word of God. It's the only tool we need to be successful in this war, to win, to find victory, to draw others from darkness into his light. And if we're going to find any success, we must not only equip ourselves with the right seed, make sure that we understand God's word and that we're sharing it, never turning it off, but we develop a lifestyle of sowing and sharing the gospel message. Secondly, that we never judge or prejudge people and determine who will or won't be saved, who will or won't receive the word of God. And third and finally, once we are able to break through and build that relationship and establish a connection and help people along their faith journey as the Holy Spirit leads us, then we must encourage them to do the same in their lives and find a place where we can all get to good ground and overcome the challenges of the world in which we live. That's the end of our lesson. I praise God for each and every one of you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for uh, uh, bearing with us a little bit longer than we've been doing these past few months. But I believe that the word of God uh, should not be compromised or, uh, or, 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 or shrunken for the sake of time. And so thank you if you stuck with us for this entire 40 minutes. And we praise God for each and every one of you. As always, we encourage you to not just worship with us in our study, but to worship with us in our giving. Here at Friendship Baptist Church, we are doing some amazing, amazing things, and we would love for you to partner with us. We do have four ways for you to support the work of the church here at Friendship. You can give on our website, www.fbcchicago.org. You can give on Cash App, dollar sign, Friendship Chicago. You can text the word GIVE to 773-992-1462, or you can give uh, uh, by check or money order, sending it to the church, Friendship Baptist Church Care, Dr. Reginald E. Backus. 5200 West Jackson Boulevard, Chicago, Illinois, 60644. I don't always do this, but I have already asked that whatever you uh, normally do in your day-to-day -day ministries uh, in terms of Christian education to double down on that. But also this week, I'm going to ask that if you have not given to Friendship before, that you would just make a $5 donation. That's all we're asking for. Just a $5 donation just to support the work that we're doing here at Friendship you can give on Cash App, our website, Tets, or you can send it into the church, a $5 donation, and we would love to see you partner with us as we continue to do the work that God has called us to do. As always, we encourage you to support the other uh, worship services that we have each and every week. On Tuesday at 8 a.m., we have a prayer call where we call out each and every person on our sick and shut-in list and ask for God's will to be done throughout all of creation, not just here at Friendship, so the access code and the phone numbers on your screen. On Tuesday evenings at 7 p.m., our laymen meet, uh, and they have a Bible study, a really good group of men that are growing in faith together. The fourth Tuesday of each month, our women of faith meet, led by our first lady, Lady Detra Bacchus, where they do social service projects throughout the year and have their own Bible study. At 6 p.m. on Wednesdays, led by our pastor, Dr. Bacchus, 
We have midweek Bible study where we are currently in evangelism. We would love to see you all there, and it's just going to double down and more thoroughly explain what we've covered in today's lesson. And then, of course, each and every Sunday morning at 11 a.m., we would love to see you here in the sanctuary, or you can join us virtually on YouTube and Facebook for our live worship service where you'll hear some of the best preaching this side of heaven by our pastor, Dr. Backus. Let's please continue to pray for each other and pray for our members. And then as always, if the Lord says the same, we invite you to join us next week, same time, same channel for another Bible lesson. Let's dismiss in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, another opportunity to study your word. Father, we thank you for all that you continue to do in our lives. Father, help us to remember that you have called us to be evangelists, to share your gospel, to go out and share the word of God so that others might see our good works but glorify you, our Father in heaven, to go out and share the word of God that others might come running and asking what must they do to be saved, to go out and share the word of God so that others might be drawn out of darkness and into your marvelous light. Equip us. Give us a desire and a heart to be more like you, to find out more about your word, to grow in understanding and knowledge, and have a boldness and a strength and a perseverance to preach and proclaim the goodness of your son, Jesus Christ, his birth, life, death, and resurrection, and that he will one day return and grant us all eternal life. Help us to share that message with all that we're receiving and hearing. Help us to understand that we are to live a lifestyle of ministering, of evangelizing, of sharing, so that everywhere we go, everything that we say, everything that we do will bring light to your glory and that others might see the love of God in all of our actions and hear it in all of our words. Thank you for our church, our pastor, Dr. Backus. Thank you for our Sunday school superintendent, Sister Williams. Thank you for every single instructor and Sunday school student throughout all of Christianity. Help us to better understand your word. Help us to have a fire to share your word and help us to be more like you in all that we do. Now, as we leave this place, we've entered this place to study through your word and we enter to serve. So equip us with all that it takes to overcome the challenges of this world and to be better representatives of you. In your son's name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. If the Lord says the same, we'll see you next week. And prayerfully, we'll see you in just a few minutes for our Sunday morning worship service. God bless.